Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And to begin with, we're going to start out with our feature tonight, the poet Maya Angelou, who died recently at the age of 86. And actually, she was much more than a poet. She was a civil rights activist, a film producer, playwright, a dancer, a college professor, and an author. In fact, her most famous work, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, which is an autobiographical tale of her life up to age 17, was one of the great works of the 20th century. Here's the biography channel, the story of Maya Angelou's life. An author, a poet, a civil rights activist, an actress, a dancer. Marguerite Johnson was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1928. When her parents divorced, she was sent with her brother to live with her grandmother in racially segregated Stamps, Arkansas. Black people depended upon other black people for sustenance, all sorts of sustenance, social, economic, and religious sustenance. As a child, she formed a strong bond with her brother, who gave her the nickname Maya. She was taught by her grandmother to celebrate life to the fullest. She would need to keep her grandmother's positive messages handy when at age seven, she was molested by her mother's boyfriend. She only told her brother, but a few days later, the attacker turned up dead. Believing her words had killed the man, I stopped speaking for five and a half years. I simply refused to speak. I had voice, but I refused. When she spoke again, she and her brother joined her mother in San Francisco. She won a scholarship to study dance and drama. While she was in San Francisco, her progressive political views began to form. At the age of 16, after quitting high school briefly to become San Francisco's first African-American cable car operator, she returned to her studies. During her senior year, she became pregnant. She gave birth to her son, Guy, and supported him working as a waitress and a cook. In 1952, she married Greek sailor Tosh Angelus and traded in her waitress uniform for a microphone. She became a singer, taking the name Maya Angelou. The marriage didn't last, but her career flourished, landing a role in the stage production of Porgy and Bess and recording the album Calypso Lady in 1957. Although she had always penned lyrics and poetry, she finally began pursuing her writing more seriously. She moved to Harlem and joined the Harlem Writers Guild. She learned how to overcome the limitations and the challenges of her youth to achieve stardom as an artist and a writer. Her unique journey continued when she moved to Cairo, Egypt with her then love interest, South African civil rights activist, Vusumzi Maki. She served as the editor of the English language weekly, The Arab Observer, before Ghana to work as editor for the Ghanaian Times. In 1964, Angelou returned to America to help her friend Malcolm X build his organization of African American unity. Those plans were scrapped when Malcolm X was assassinated in 1965. The assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968 left her devastated. But along with the great joys and painful lows she had experienced, her rich life served as the inspiration for her memoir, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Published in 1970, covering the early years of her life, it was a critical and commercial triumph. In the following years, more books followed, including four more volumes of her autobiography. By the 1980s and 90s, America as a whole, regardless of race, had a profound appreciation of her talents as an artist, as a poet, and writer. And so now she is widely seen as a national treasure. In 1993, she was asked by incoming President Bill Clinton to compose a poem, which she would recite at the inauguration. Since 1981, she has served as a Reynolds Professor of American Studies at Wake Forest. And she has still found time to act in films and even host a radio show on Oprah Winfrey's XM Radio Network. Well, her other great work besides I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings was her poem On the Pulse of Morning, which she read at the inauguration of Bill Clinton in 1993. She was only the second poet to present an inauguration, the only other one being Robert Frost at the inauguration of John Kennedy in 1961. Here's a little of that presentation. Mr. President and Mrs. Clinton, Mr. Vice President and Mrs. Gore, and Americans everywhere, a rock, a river, a tree, hosts to species long since departed, 
marked the mastodon, the dinosaur, who left dry tokens of their sojourn here on our planet floor. Any broad alarm of their hastening doom is lost in the gloom of dust and ages. But today, the rock cries out to us clearly, forcefully, come, you may stand upon my back and face your distant destiny, but seek no haven in my shadow. I will give you no hiding place down here. We'll close with some of the best quotes that Time Magazine put together from Maya Angelou. I am grateful to be, have been loved and to be loved now and to be able to love because that liberates. Love liberates. Here, on the path of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning. I know what the caged bird feels when the sun is bright on the upland slopes, when the wind blows soft through the springing grass and the river floats like a sheet of glass. It's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally. People have to develop courage. It is most important of all the virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. Every one of us needs to say to our children, children, this is your world. Come out, stand out, earn it. And we have the chance to be rainbow in their clouds. Amazing, the power we have, each of us, young, middle-aged, or like me, upper middle age. I don't know how much longer I will be around or how much longer I want to write about people I've known and times I've lived and things I've done. But if there is time, I'll probably be writing when the Lord says, Maya, my endless time. I'll probably be writing a poem or trying to write some music or an autobiography. Maya Angelou. We're going to move on now to Donald Levine. Donald Levine was a nice Jewish boy from Syracuse University who went on to become a Hasbro executive, and he designed one of the most popular toys of the 20th century, G.I. Joe. It was sort of a doll for boys. Of course, they would never say that. And it was introduced in 1964, right before the Vietnam War, while the country still thought of soldiers as being from the Korean War or from World War II. When the Vietnam War became unpopular, G.I. Joe became an action figure, and he spawned books, games, and collectors clubs. Listen to this report where Donald Levine talks a lot about his creation of the character, and then you'll be able to answer the trivia question, what actor was the model for G.I. Joe? G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe, fighting man from head to toe, on the land of the sea in the air. In 1964, just five years after Barbie burst onto the scene, another doll took the world by storm. But this one packed a pistol and an M16. When you get G.I. Joe and the authentic G.I. Joe equipment, you'll have the greatest realism, the greatest fun you ever had in playing soldier. Remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. The inspiration for this scar-faced soldier came to creator Don Levine from the window display of a New York City art supply store. In the window, they had these movable wooden mannequins which artists used to pose and do their artwork. And it struck me, let me buy a dozen of these and take them home. Maybe we dress them up in military outfits. And that's how it all started. Up until that point, the only military figures they had were these die cast and lead soldiers, which were always successful. I wanted to make sure that G.I. Joe could be posed. Uh, he could sit at the wheel of a Jeep. Uh, he could throw a grenade. Uh, he could walk. He could sit down. He could go into an airplane. Uh, he had to be movable. If he wasn't movable, uh, we didn't have a concept. Within a few short weeks, the basic 12-inch plastic male figure with 21 movable joints was complete. But one crucial element was missing. We needed a name. And believe me, we struggled with different names. And uh, we thought that uh, at that time we should call him Ace the Fighter Pilot, Rocky the Marine, uh, Salty the Sailor. We did a lot of things. And one day, 
I'm watching a movie that comes on called The Story of G.I. Joe. Uh, and it starred a fellow named Robert Mitchum who played G.I. Joe. I looked at that and I said, oh my, this could be the name. And with that, Don Levine's double-jointed doll was ready to do battle. And lots of people said to us, you are crazy. No boy, no father, no mother would let a little boy play with this doll. So we automatically said, let's never call it a doll. Let's call it a movable action figure. And while boys may not have yearned to play with dolls, they were eager to get their hands on a movable action figure. This was a figure where the uh, kid could sit there, unsnap uh, buttons and uh, buckle the belts and reach in and pull the canteen out. There was a lot of finger food that had always been for girls, and this was for boys, and nobody had ever done that before. Because imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and millions of dollars were at stake, G.I. Joe's creator wanted some special way to distinguish his movable action figure from the look-alike dolls that were sure to follow. It was always my dream to copyright, patent, and trademark G.I. Joe. And they said, Mr. Levine, you cannot copyright and trademark the human body. We all own that. You can't own it as a toy company. But if there was something distinctive about G.I. Joe, if you could do that, perhaps that could protect you. I said, let's put a scar on his face. And that's how the G.I. Joe scar was born. A lot of people thought that Barbie might have scratched G.I. Joe. Not a true story. In addition to Joe's obvious facial blemish, another one-of-a-kind but little-known defect was intentionally sculpted into the action figure's left hand. If you have a chance to look closely at the thumb, you'll notice that the thumbnail is not on top, it's on the bottom. We did that specifically to show that if someone came in and copied the body exactly, we would know that they were infringing on our design. For more than four years, G.I. Joe won nearly every battle he faced. But in 1969, Joe took it on the chin. Like his comrades in arms, those little green army men, Joe suffered from a backlash of anti-war sentiment. Joe's creators knew that for the action figure to weather the turbulent social climate of the late 60s, they would have to give Joe new marching orders. Trouble is our business. We said, instead of strictly military, let's make G.I. Joe an adventurer. Every set had a goal. You capture the gorilla, you kill the shark, you rescue the idol, you dig up the mummy's tombs. It's still very much action-oriented, but with a different goal than, than the 60s military stuff. In recent years, thanks to a wave of nostalgia for the original stoic soldier, the 12-inch G.I. Joe has been recommissioned in a collector's edition series. We've got adult men who keep telling me stories about oh, G.I. Joe was such a big part of my childhood. And the reason why I have interest in G.I. Joe today is because it brings me back to those wonderful childhood memories. The best part of the G.I. Joe was all the accessories that went with it. Um, we had the talking G.I. Joe pulling the dog tags. We had the lifelike hair G.I. Joe. We had like the art of fatigue and the khaki stuff and the underwater stuff. It was just great. It was really, you never got tired of playing with it because there was so much of it. You could get like 20 of them and you could have a big adventure and you know, when your parents like lock in, you're stuck there in the middle of New Jersey. But you could go anywhere with G.I. Joe. Of course, they're all trash now and uh, we could be very wealthy if we had them all. Uh, there's an old saying that soldiers never die. Moms just throw them away. We give a lot of mothers around the country a chance to uh, come back and say, I'm sorry I threw your G.I. Joe away 30 years ago. Here it is again. Have some fun with it. Remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And in closing tonight, we're going to make a brief mention of Andre Papp, who died recently at the age of 90. He was a French composer who composed a tune called La More Bleu. It's better known in the United States as Love is Blue, and it became one of the most popular instrumentals of the 20th century. A version by the Paul Myriad Orchestra was number one in the United States for over a month. It was the biggest instrumental in the 1960s, next to a theme from a summer place. Mm -hmm.